Self-Improvement 101 By John C. Maxwell Part 1 Laying a Foundation for Self-Improvement 1. What will it take for Me to improve? Growth must be intentional, nobody improves by accident. The poet Robert Browning wrote, Why stay we on the earth except to grow? Just about anyone would agree that growing is a good thing, but relatively few people dedicate themselves to the process. Why? Because it requires change, and most people are reluctant to change. But the truth is that, without change, growth is impossible. Author Gail Sheehy asserted, If we don't change, we don't grow. If we don't grow, we are not really living. Growth demands a temporary surrender of security. It may mean a giving up of familiar but limiting patterns, safe but unrewarding work, values no longer believed in, relationships that have lost their meaning. As Dostoevsky put it, taking a new step, uttering a new word, is what most people fear most. The real fear should be the opposite course. I can't think of anything worse than living a stagnant life, devoid of change and improvement. Self-Improvement 101 By John C. Maxwell Part 1 Laying a Foundation for Self-Improvement 1. What will it take for Me to improve? Growth must be intentional, nobody improves by accident. The poet Robert Browning wrote, Why stay we on the earth except to grow? Just about anyone would agree that growing is a good thing, but relatively few people dedicate themselves to the process. Why? Because it requires change, and most people are reluctant to change. But the truth is that, without change, growth is impossible. Author Gail Sheehy asserted, If we don't change, we don't grow. If we don't grow, we are not really living. Growth demands a temporary surrender of security. It may mean a giving up of familiar but limiting patterns, safe but unrewarding work, values no longer believed in, relationships that have lost their meaning. As Dostoevsky put it, taking a new step, uttering a new word, is what most people fear most. The real fear should be the opposite course. I can't think of anything worse than living a stagnant life, devoid of change and improvement. 1. Choose a life of growth. It's said that when Spanish composer cellist Pablo Casals was in the final years of his life, a young reporter asked him, Mr. Casals, you are 95 years old and the greatest cellist that ever lived. Why do you still practice six hours a day? What was Casals' answer? Because I think I'm making progress. That's the kind of dedication to continual growth that you should have. The people who reach their potential, no matter what their profession or background, think in terms of improvement. If you think you can hold your ground and still make the success journey, you are mistaken. You need to have an attitude like that of General George Patton. It's said that he told his troops, There is one thing I want you to remember. I don't want to get any messages saying we are holding our position. We are advancing constantly. Patton's motto was, always take the offensive. Never dig in. The only way to improve the quality of your life is to improve yourself. If you want to grow your organization, you must grow a leader. If you want better children, you must become a better person. If you want others to treat you more kindly, you must develop better people skills. There is no sure way to make other people in your environment improve. The only thing you truly have the ability to improve is yourself. And the amazing thing is that when you do, everything else around you suddenly gets better. So the bottom line is that if you want to take the success journey, you must live a life of growth. And the only way you will grow is if you choose to grow. 2. Start growing today. Napoleon Hill said, It's not what you are going to do, but it's what you are doing now that counts. Many unsuccessful people have what I call someday sickness because they could do some things to bring value to their lives right now. But they put them off and say they'll do them someday. Their motto is one of these days. But as the old English proverb says, one of these days means none of these days. 
the best way to ensure success is to start growing today. No matter where you may be starting from, don't be discouraged, everyone who got where he has started where he was. Why do you need to determine to start growing today? There are several reasons. Growth is not automatic. In my book Breakthrough Parenting, I mention that you can be young only once, but you can be immature indefinitely. Point one that's because growth is not automatic. Just because you grow older doesn't mean you keep growing. That's how it is with some creatures, such as crustaceans. As a crab or a lobster ages, it grows and has to shed its shell. But that's not the trend for people. The road to the next level is uphill, and it takes effort to keep growing. The sooner you start, the closer to reaching your potential you'll be. Growth today will provide a better tomorrow. Everything you do today builds on what you did yesterday. And altogether, those things determine what will happen tomorrow. That's especially true in regard to growth. Oliver Wendell Holmes offered this insight, man's mind, once stretched by new ideas, never regains its original dimensions. Growth today is an investment for tomorrow. Growth is your responsibility. When you were a small child, your parents were responsible for you, even for your growth and education. But as an adult, you bear that responsibility entirely. If you don't make growth your responsibility, it will never happen. There is no time like right now to get started. Recognize the importance that personal growth plays in success, and commit yourself to developing your potential today. 3. Focus on self-development, not self-fulfillment. There has been a change in focus over the last 30 years in the area of personal growth. Beginning in the late 60s and early 70s, people began talking about finding themselves, meaning that they were searching for a way to become self-fulfilled. It's like making happiness a goal because self-fulfillment is about feeling good. But self-development is different. Sure, much of the time it will make you feel good, but that's a byproduct, not the goal. Self-development is a higher calling, it is the development of your potential so that you can attain the purpose for which you were created. There are times when that's fulfilling, but other times it's not. But no matter how it makes you feel, self-development always has one effect, it draws you toward your destiny. Rabbi Samuel M. Silver taught that the greatest of all miracles is that we need not be tomorrow what we are today, but we can improve if we make use of the potential implanted in us by God. 4. Never stay satisfied with current accomplishments. My friend Rick Warren says, the greatest enemy of tomorrow's success is today's success. And he is right. Thinking that you have arrived when you accomplish a goal has the same effect as believing you know it all. It takes away your desire to learn. It's another characteristic of destination disease. But successful people don't sit back and rest on their laurels. They know that wins, like losses, are temporary, and they have to keep growing if they want to continue being successful. Charles Handy remarked, It is one of the paradoxes of success that the things and ways which got you there are seldom those things that keep you there. No matter how successful you are today, don't get complacent. Stay hungry. Sidney Harris insisted that a winner knows how much he still has to learn, even when he is considered an expert by others. A loser wants to be considered an expert by others before he has learned enough to know how little he knows. Don't settle into a comfort zone, and don't let success go to your head. Enjoy your success briefly, and then move on to greater growth. Five. Be a continual learner. The best way to keep from becoming satisfied with your current achievements is to make yourself a continual learner. That kind of commitment may be rarer than you realize. For example, a study performed by the University of Michigan several years ago found that one-third of all physicians in the United States are so busy working that they're two years behind the breakthroughs in their own fields. Point two. If you want to be a continual learner and keep growing throughout your life, you'll have to carve out the time to do it. You'll have to do what you can wherever you are. As Henry Ford said, it's been my observation that most successful people get ahead during the time other people waste. 
That's one reason I carry books and magazines with me whenever I travel. During the downtimes, such as waiting for a connection in an airport, I can go through a stack of magazines, reading and cutting out articles. Or I can skim through a book, learning the major concepts and pulling out quotes I'll be able to use later. And when I'm in town, I maximize my learning time by continually listening to instructive tapes in the car. Franke Clark stated, most of us must learn a great deal every day in order to keep ahead of what we forget. Learning something every day is the essence of being a continual learner. You must keep improving yourself, not only acquiring knowledge to replace what you forget or what's out of date, but building on what you learned yesterday. 6. Develop a plan for growth. The key to a life of continual learning and improvement lies in developing a specific plan for growth and following through with it. I recommend a plan that requires an hour a day, five days a week. I use that as the pattern because of a statement by Earl Nightingale, which says, if a person will spend one hour a day on the same subject for five years, that person will be an expert on that subject. Isn't that an incredible promise? It shows how far we are capable of going when we have the discipline to make growth our daily practice. When I teach leadership conferences, I recommend the following growth plan to participants. Monday, spend one hour with a devotional to develop your spiritual life. Tuesday, spend one hour listening to a leadership podcast or audio lesson. Wednesday, spend one hour filing quotes and reflecting on the content of Tuesday's tape. Thursday, spend one hour reading a book on leadership. Friday, spend half the hour reading the book and the other half filing and reflecting. As you develop your plan for growth, start by identifying the three to five areas in which you desire to grow. Then look for useful materials, books, magazines, audio tapes, videos, and incorporate them into your plan. I recommend that you make it your goal to read 12 books and listen to 52 tapes, or read 52 articles, each year. Exactly how you go about it doesn't matter, but do it daily. That way you're more likely to follow through and get it done than if you periodically put it off and then try to catch up. 7. Pay the price. I mentioned before that self-fulfillment focuses on making a person happy, whereas self-development proposes to help a person reach potential. A trade-off of growth is that it is sometimes uncomfortable. It requires discipline. It takes time that you could spend on leisure activities. It costs money to buy materials. You have to face constant change and take risks. And sometimes it's just plain lonely. That's why many people stop growing when the price gets high. But growth is always worth the price you pay because the alternative is a limited life with unfulfilled potential. Success takes effort, and you can't make the journey if you're sitting back waiting for life to come along and improve you. President Theodore Roosevelt boldly stated, There has not yet been a person in our history who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. Those words were true when he spoke them almost a century ago, and they still apply today. 8. Find a way to apply what you learn. Jim Rohn urged, Don't let your learning lead to knowledge. Let your learning lead to action. The bottom line when it comes to personal development is action. If your life doesn't begin to change as a result of what you're learning, you're experiencing one of these problems, you're not giving your growth plan enough time and attention, you're focusing too much time on the wrong areas, or you're not applying what you learn. Successful people develop positive daily habits that help them to grow and learn. One of the things I do to make sure I don't lose what I learn is file it. In my office I have more than 1200 files full of articles and information and I have thousands upon thousands of quotes. But I also make an effort to apply information as soon as I learn it. I do that by asking myself these questions anytime I learn something new. Where can I use it? When can I use it? Who else needs to know it? These questions take my focus off simply acquiring knowledge and put it onto applying what I learned to my life. Try using them. I think they'll do the same for you. Author and leadership expert Fred Smith made a statement that summarizes what committing to personal growth is really all about. He said, 
something in human nature tempts us to stay where we're comfortable. We try to find a plateau, a resting place, where we have comfortable stress and adequate finances. Where we have comfortable associations with people, without the intimidation of meeting new people and entering strange situations. Of course, all of us need to plateau for a time. We climb and then plateau for assimilation. But once we've assimilated what we've learned, we climb again. It's unfortunate when we've done our last climb. When we have made our last climb, we are old, whether 40 or 80. Whatever you do, don't allow yourself to stay on a plateau. Commit yourself to climbing the mountain of personal potential, a little at a time, throughout your life. It's one journey you'll never regret having made. According to novelist George Eliot, it is never too late to be what you might have become. 2. How can I grow in my career? Be better tomorrow than you are today. Turkey was chatting with a bull. I would love to be able to get to the top of that tree, sighed the turkey, but I haven't got the energy. Well, replied the bull, why don't you nibble on some of my droppings? They're packed with nutrients. The turkey pecked at a lump of dung and found that it actually gave him enough strength to reach the lowest branch of the tree. The next day, after eating some more dung, he reached the second branch. Finally, after a fourth night, there he was proudly perched at the top of the tree. But he was promptly spotted by a hunter who shot him down out of the tree. The moral of the story, BS might get you to the top, but it won't keep you there. 1.1. How growth helps you lead up. I've met a lot of people who have destination disease. They think that they have arrived by obtaining a specific position or getting to a certain level in an organization. When they get to that desired place, they stop striving to grow or improve. What a waste of potential. There's certainly nothing wrong with the desire to progress in your career, but never try to arrive. Instead, Intend your journey to be open-ended. Most people have no idea how far they can go in life. They aim way too low. I know I did when I first started out, but my life began changing when I stopped setting goals for where I wanted to be and started setting the course for who I wanted to be. I have discovered for others and me that the key to personal development is being more growth-oriented than goal-oriented. There is no downside to making growth your goal. If you keep learning, you will be better tomorrow than you are today, and that can do so many things for you. 1.2. The better you are, the more people listen. If you had an interest in cooking, with whom would you rather spend an hour? Mario Batali, chef, cookbook author, owner of Babo Ristorante e Enoteca and other restaurants in New York City and host of two shows on the Food Network, or your neighbor who loves to cook and actually does it every once in a while. Or if you were a leadership student, as I am, would you rather spend that hour with the President of the United States or with the person who runs the local convenience store? It's no contest. Why? Because you respect most and can learn best from the person with great competence and experience. Competence is a key to credibility and credibility is the key to influencing others. If people respect you, they will listen to you. President Abraham Lincoln said, I don't think much of a man who is not wiser today than he was yesterday. By focusing on growth, you become wiser each day. The better you are, the greater your value today. If you were to plant fruit and nut trees in your yard, when could you expect to start harvesting from them? Would you be surprised to learn that you had to wait years, 3 to 7 years for fruit, 5 to 15 years for nuts? If you want a tree to produce, first you have to let it grow. The more the tree has grown and has created strong roots that can sustain it, the more it can produce. The more it can produce, the greater its value. People are not all that different. The more they grow, the more valuable they are because they can produce more. In fact, it's said that a tree keeps growing as long as it is living. I would love to live in such a way that the same could be said for me, he kept growing until the day he died. I love this quote from Albert Hubbard, if what you did yesterday still looks big to you, you haven't done much today. 
If you look back at past accomplishments, and they don't look small to you now, then you haven't grown very much since you completed them. If you look back at a job you did years ago, and you don't think you could do it better now, then you're not improving in that area of your life. If you are not continually growing, then it is probably damaging your leadership ability. Warren Bennis and Bert Nanus, authors of Leaders, The Strategies for Taking Charge, said, it is the capacity to develop and improve their skills that distinguishes leaders from followers. One if you're not moving forward as a learner, then you are moving backward as a leader. 1.3. The better you are, the greater your potential for. Tomorrow. Who are the hardest people to teach? The people who have never tried to learn. Getting them to accept a new idea is like trying to transplant a tomato plant into concrete. Even if you could get it to go into the ground, you know it isn't going to survive anyway. The more you learn and grow, the greater your capacity to keep learning. And that makes your potential greater and your value for tomorrow higher. Indian reformer Mahatma Gandhi said, The difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. That is how great our potential is. All we have to do is keep fighting to learn more grow more, become more. One leader I interviewed for this book told me that when he was in his first job, his boss would sit him down after he made a mistake and talk it through with him. Every time before he left one of those meetings, his boss asked, did you learn something from this? And he would ask him to explain. At the time, this young leader thought his boss was being pretty tough on him. But as he progressed through his career, he discovered that many of his successes could be traced back to practices he adopted as a result of those talks. It made a huge positive impact on him because it kept making him better. If you want to influence the people who are ahead of you in the organization and keep influencing them, then you need to keep getting better. An investment in your growth is an investment in your ability, your adaptability, and your promotability. No matter how much it costs you to keep growing and learning, the cost of doing nothing is greater. 1.4. How to Become Better Tomorrow Founding Father Ben Franklin said, By improving yourself, the world is made better. Be not afraid of growing too slowly. Be afraid only of standing still. Forget your mistakes, but remember what they taught you. So how do you become better tomorrow? By becoming better today. The secret of your success can be found in your daily agenda. Here's what I suggest you do to keep growing and leading up. 1. Learn your craft today. On a wall in the office of a huge tree farm hangs a sign. It says, the best time to plant a tree is 25 years ago. The second best time is today. There is no time like the present to become an expert at your craft. Maybe you wish you had started earlier. Or maybe you wish you had found a better teacher or mentor years ago. None of that matters. Looking back and lamenting will not help you move forward. A friend of the poet Longfellow asked the secret of his continued interest in life. Pointing to a nearby apple tree, Longfellow said, The purpose of that apple tree is to grow a little new wood each year. That is what I plan to do. The friend would have found a similar sentiment in one of Longfellow's poems. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us further than today. Point two. You may not be where you're supposed to be. You may not be what you want to be. You don't have to be what you used to be. And you don't have to ever arrive. You just need to learn to be the best you can be right now. As Napoleon Hill said, you can't change where you started, but you can change the direction you are going. It's not what you are going to do, but it's what you are doing now that counts. 2. Talk your craft today. Once you reach a degree of proficiency in your craft, then one of the best things you can do for yourself is talk your craft with others on the same and higher levels than you. Many people do this naturally. Guitarists talk about Guitars Parents talk about raising children. Golfers talk about golf. They do so because it's enjoyable, it fuels their passion, it teaches them new skills and insights, and it prepares them to take action. 
Talking to peers is wonderful, but if you don't also make an effort to strategically talk your craft with those ahead of you in experience and skill, then you're really missing learning opportunities. Douglas Randlett meets regularly with a group of retired multimillionaires so that he can learn from them. Before he retired, Major League Baseball player Tony Gwynn was known to talk hitting with anybody who had knowledge about it. Every time he saw Ted Williams, they talked hitting. I enjoy talking about leadership with good leaders all the time. In fact, I make it a point to schedule a learning lunch with someone I admire, at least six times a year. Before I go, I study up on them by reading their books, studying their lessons, listening to their speeches, or whatever else I need to do. My goal is to learn enough about them and their sweet spot to ask the right questions. If I do that, then I can learn from their strengths. But that's not my ultimate goal. My goal is to learn what I can transfer from their strength zones to mine. That's where my growth will come from, not from what they're doing. I have to apply what I learn to my situation. The secret to a great interview is listening. It is the bridge between learning about them and learning about you. And that's your objective. 3. Practice your craft today. William Osler, the physician who wrote The Principles and Practice of Medicine in 1892, once told a group of medical students, Banish the future. Live only for the hour and it's allotted work. Think not of the amount to be accomplished, the difficulties to be overcome, or the end to be attained, but set earnestly at the little task at your elbow, letting that be sufficient for the day, for surely our plain duty is, as Carlyle says, not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. The only way to improve is to practice your craft until you know it inside and out. At first, you do what you know to do. The more you practice your craft, the more you know. But as you do more, you will also discover more about what you ought to do differently. At that point you have a decision to make, will you do what you have always done, or will you try to do more of what you think you should do? The only way you improve is to get out of your comfort zone and try new things. People often ask me, how can I grow my business, or how can I make my department better? The answer is for you personally to grow. The only way to grow your organization is to grow the leaders who run it. By making yourself better, you make others better. Retired General Electric CEO Jack Welch said, Before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. 3. And the time to start is today. 3. Look for and plan teachable moments. If you look for opportunities to learn in every situation, you will become a talent plus person and expand your talent to its potential. But you can also take another step beyond that and actively seek out and plan teachable moments. You can do that by reading books, visiting places that will inspire you, attending events that will prompt you to pursue change, listening to lessons, and spending time with people who will stretch you and expose you to new experiences. I've had the privilege to spend time with many remarkable people, and the natural reward has been the opportunity to learn. In my personal relationships, I've also gravitated toward people from whom I can learn. My closest friends are people who challenge my thinking, and often change it. They lift me up in many ways. And I've found that I often live out something stated by Spanish philosopher and writer Baltasar Gracian, Make your friends your teachers and mingle the pleasures of conversation with the advantages of instruction. You can do the same. Cultivate friendships with people who challenge and add value to you, and try to do the same for them. It will change your life. 4. Make your teachable moments count. Even people who are strategic about seeking teachable moments can miss the whole point of the experience. I say this because for 30 years I've been a speaker at conferences and workshops, events that are designed to help people learn. But I've found that many people walk away from an event and do very little with what they heard after closing their notebooks. It would be like a jewelry designer going to a gem merchant to buy fine gems, placing them carefully into a case, and then putting that case on the shelf to collect dust. What's the value of acquiring the gems if they're never going to be used? We tend to focus on learning events instead of the learning process. Because of this, 
I try to help people take action steps that will help them implement what they learn. I suggest that in their notes, they use a code to mark things that jump out at them. T indicates you need to some time thinking on that point. C indicates something you need to change. A smiley face means you are doing that thing particularly well. A indicates something you need to apply. S means you need to share that information with someone else. After the conference I recommend that they create to-do lists based on what they marked, then schedule time to follow through. 5. Ask yourself, am I really teachable? I've said it before, but it bears repeating, all the good advice in the world won't help if you don't have a teachable spirit. To know whether you are really open to new ideas and new ways of doing things, answer the following questions. 1. Am I open to other people's ideas? 2. Do I listen more than I talk? 3. Am I open to changing my opinion based on new information? 4. Do I readily admit when I am wrong? 5. Do I observe before acting on a situation? 6. Do I ask questions? 7. Am I willing to ask a question that will expose my ignorance? 8. Am I open to doing things in a way I haven't done before? 9. Am I willing to ask for directions? 10. Do I act defensive when criticized, or do I listen openly for the truth? If you answered no to one or more of these questions, then you have room to grow in the area of teachability. You need to soften your attitude and learn humility, and remember the words of John Wooden, everything we know we learn from someone else. Thomas Edison was the guest of the governor of North Carolina when the politician complimented him on his creative genius. I am not a great inventor, countered Edison. But you have more than a thousand patents to your credit, the governor stated. Yes, but about the only invention I can really claim as absolutely original is the phonograph, Edison replied. I'm afraid I don't understand what you mean, the governor remarked. Well, explained Edison, I guess I'm an awfully good sponge. I absorb ideas from every course I can, and put them to practical use. Then I improve them until they become of some value. The ideas which I use are mostly the ideas of other people who don't develop them themselves. What a remarkable description of someone who used teachability to expand his talent. That is what a talent plus person does. That is what all of us should strive to do. 3. Look for and plan teachable moments. If you look for opportunities to learn in every situation, you will become a talent plus person and expand your talent to its potential. But you can also take another step beyond that and actively seek out and plan teachable moments. You can do that by reading books, visiting places that will inspire you, attending events that will prompt you to pursue change, listening to lessons, and spending time with people who will stretch you and expose you to new experiences. I've had the privilege to spend time with many remarkable people, and the natural reward has been the opportunity to learn. In my personal relationships, I've also gravitated toward people from whom I can learn. My closest friends are people who challenge my thinking, and often change it. They lift me up in many ways. And I've found that I often live out something stated by Spanish philosopher and writer Baltasar Gracian, make your friends your teachers and mingle the pleasures of conversation with the advantages of instruction. You can do the same. Cultivate friendships with people who challenge and add value to you, and try to do the same for them. It will change your life. 4. Make your teachable moments count. Even people who are strategic about seeking teachable moments can miss the whole point of the experience. I say this because for 30 years I've been a speaker at conferences and workshops, events that are designed to help people learn. But I've found that many people walk away from an event and do very little with what they heard after closing their notebooks. It would be like a jewelry designer going to a gem merchant to buy fine gems, placing them carefully into a case, and then putting that case on the shelf to collect dust. What's the value of acquiring the gems if they're never going to be used? We tend to focus on learning events instead of the learning process. Because of this, I try to help people take action steps that will help them implement what they learn. I suggest that in their notes, they use a code to mark things that jump out at them. 
T indicates you need to some time thinking on that point. C indicates something you need to change. A smiley face means you are doing that thing particularly well. A indicates something you need to apply. S means you need to share that information with someone else. After the conference I recommend that they create to-do lists based on what they marked, then schedule time to follow through. 5. Ask yourself, am I really teachable? I've said it before, but it bears repeating, all the good advice in the world won't help if you don't have a teachable spirit. To know whether you are really open to new ideas and new ways of doing things, answer the following questions. 1. Am I open to other people's ideas? 2. Do I listen more than I talk? 3. Am I open to changing my opinion based on new information? 4. Do I readily admit when I am wrong? 5. Do I observe before acting on a situation? 6. Do I ask questions? 7. Am I willing to ask a question that will expose my ignorance? 8. Am I open to doing things in a way I haven't done before? 9. Am I willing to ask for directions? 10. Do I act defensive when criticized, or do I listen openly for the truth? If you answered no to one or more of these questions, then you have room to grow in the area of teachability. You need to soften your attitude and learn humility, and remember the words of John Wooden, everything we know we learn from someone else. Thomas Edison was the guest of the governor of North Carolina when the politician complimented him on his creative genius. I am not a great inventor, countered Edison. But you have more than a thousand patents to your credit, the governor stated. Yes, but about the only invention I can really claim as absolutely original is the phonograph, Edison replied. I'm afraid I don't understand what you mean, the governor remarked. Well, explained Edison, I guess I'm an awfully good sponge. I absorb ideas from every course I can, and put them to practical use. Then I improve them until they become of some value. The ideas which I use are mostly the ideas of other people who don't develop them themselves. What a remarkable description of someone who used teachability to expand his talent. That is what a talent plus person does. That is what all of us should strive to do.